Hello there, and welcome to Canon on the Couch. Tonight, uh, we have an international award winner, uh, director, cinematographer, and producer um, who has um, featured in some outstanding series such as the Netflix Tales by Light, uh, Big Cat Tales, and of course, um, winning a, an award for the 2017 Cinematography Awards as well. So very, very special guest tonight, talking all things cinematography and juggling creative ambitions, um, as well as producing uh, outstanding work as well. So let me introduce uh, our guest for tonight, Abraham Joff. Abraham, thanks for joining us. Hey, Jackson, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely our pleasure. Now, Abraham, um, just quickly, obviously, and the, and the first thing I wanted to ask you, um, which I, I did find on your bio itself, um, where it said you, you kind of knew from a very early age um, what your calling was. Um, can you explain just briefly what your calling is and um, how that's impacted your way of life? Oh, let's start with a big one, I guess. Um, thanks, Jackson. Uh, I mean, I was really... Very, very lucky um, to have an incredible childhood. I mean, a lot of people have pretty uh, happy childhoods, hopefully, but mine was was yeah. particularly special. Uh, yeah. My siblings and I, we we were taken around Australia for three years uh, on the road. Uh, this is mid nineties, early early nineties, um, mm -hmm. while my parents wrote books uh, about Australia's greatest living characters, un un unknown identities around Australia. Yeah. And my mum's a teacher, and we had this just just very, very special childhood, being in nature, but not only seeing the great country of Australia, but also meeting all these wonderful people, unknown identities um, from scientists to drovesmen to you know, Aboriginal elders, uh, World War Two, World War One veterans. I met two, uh, over a dozen World War One veterans, and I got to see on the interviews with these incredible men. Those ones particularly stood out to me, even at you know when I was. 10, 11 years old, I, you know, it was, mm. I was aware of how special it was to speak to someone who was fighting in the trenches in yeah. France in World War I. Um, so I think it was a combination of being uh, surrounded by Australia's great nature uh, from the Barrier Reef, the rainforest, the deserts, and, and just seeing everything, every inch of Australia um, to also meeting the people, the combination of both. And then I think the other thing that was, that definitely left a, a big mark on me was meeting Malcolm Douglas, who was, the original filmmaker, Bushman, well before any of the others came along. In the 90, early 1960s, Malcolm Douglas took a, um, with a friend, David Oldfield, travelled across the top of Australia and made a film on, on, on Super 8 film uh, okay. across the top. And then he went on to make 60 films about the Australian bush and bush tucker and Aboriginals. And I, got, I grew up watching his films in Sydney then we got to meet him. I got to meet him in Broome. We stayed on his crocodile farm for several weeks. And I got to see him, you know, producing films at the time, you know, this is 93, 94. And then I spent the next several years sending him little home movies that I was making as I was growing up, sending them to Malcolm yeah. Douglas in Broome when I got back to Sydney saying, you know, when can I work for you? When can I work for you? One day. And then in uh, 2001, uh, first year out of school, I went to film school. Um, he came to Sydney to edit um, his latest series and asked me to come in and do some editing for him um which i did uh, i was 19 at the time and then he asked me to come back to Broome if i wanted to be his cameraman for yep. a series so that was my big break and 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 what a break for a 19 year old kid um next thing i knew i was up in the kimberleys with him filming crocodile and fishing stories i was i jumped into the television you know, like i was actually now in the show helping make the show that i grew up on that was that was definitely a huge milestone for me. Um, so yeah. had I not had all those um, opportunities um, early on, you know, would I have eventually gravitated to filmmaking? I, I don't know, really hard to say, but it certainly gave me a huge head start. You know, by the time I was in my early 20s, I was already, you know, I was already on my path. Yeah, for sure. Can I ask, do you think, like, knowing, I guess, the path or, or, or your direction and, and what you wanted to do, do you, do you did you find that, was was easy or was that actually a, a bit more of a burden at the same time? Um, I think what was, uh, for me, my paradigm, and I, I mean, I was thinking about it a little bit before this uh, meeting today, um, I guess I was, I was always exposed to people who were just 
carving their own path, you know, from the very yeah. beginning. So it never felt like an un, an unusual thing to me. You know, I didn't, mm. you know, those years of meeting people like Malcolm who had extraordinary, very unique lives and have just really done their own thing. I saw that everywhere I turned. So to do your own thing seemed like the normal thing to do. You know, it wasn't, I didn't grow up in an academic family where everyone went to university and, and had a more traditional mm -hmm. path. Uh, yep. It was, you know, um, it was much, much more, um, you know, varied. And, and so, yeah, I think, um, but of course, you know, as any young person can relate, I still didn't feel completely um, sure of myself and knowing where I wanted to fit into the world. And, you know, I still had the same anxieties as everyone else has leaving school. And, you know, I, I did go to film school, um, didn't, I mean, it was great. And I definitely took some things away from it, but it was, it was mm. the pathway to, I guess, feature films and TV shows, um, more traditional um, television. Um, I just sort of knew fairly early on that wasn't really where I wanted to be. I, I was definitely interested in documentaries, real world, uh, and not the scripted world. As much as I love a, a great film, as much as anyone, um, it's, you know, I have a, a huge appreciation and love of watching film, theatrical, you know, mm. fiction. I'm still drawn more to the documentary and, and real world. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you find when, when choosing your direction, um, because I, I've, I've heard a lot of people that, a passion can turn into a job and then com completely cr crush a passion. Um, mm. in, in your direction um, and not working on theatrical films, do you think that's maybe a direction that would have crushed a, a bit of your passion in terms of your journey and appreciation for those films? Um, I think when you're young, and my advice always, um, I still feel like I'm young, but my advice to young people is, <clears throat> you know, have no experience is a wasted experience. I think, you know, even yeah. if it, it tells you that, okay, I don't, this is not where I want to be, that's still valuable. So I think yeah. always take every opportunity. You never know in your early days, take every opportunity. You don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know what you're going to pick up. Might be one nugget of information from going on to a set. So I, you know, I went on to short films. I, I helped out on short films. I also, one of the things which was brilliant is, you yeah. know, in those, um, particularly early 2000s, there was a lot of, films being made in Sydney. I think there was a tax, you know, quite an attractive tax proposition at mm. you know, the time of The Matrix and um, yeah. you know, Stealth and Superman and there was a whole series yeah. of films that were being made in Sydney. And I, and I worked as an extra on a lot of those films. I, I was sad I missed out on Matrix, actually. I started just after that. That would have been very cool. But I was on, I was a, a, a background artist, <laughs> an extra on uh, on a bunch of these films. Um, and you can spot me if, uh, if, you, if you've got a very eagle eye on a few of these Films, but what was what was amazing about it is I could actually be on the set, um, on a Hollywood movie set to see what that was like. I mean, that that that's, yep. that was amazing. Um, you know, I remember being on the set of Superman, uh, sorry, Stealth, and mm. Dean Sendler, who's one of my cinematography heroes, who shot Dances with Wolves, one of my all-time favorite films. He was the the DP on that, and you know, just standing a few feet away from him and watching him, you know, direct the the crew and you know, mm. eyeballing, they were measuring. With tape measures, obviously, how many feet to the to the film um, to the actors, and he was just sort of he just said oh, it's twenty three feet four inches, and then they'd measure it, and it was twenty three feet four inches. Like, and you know, all these all the crew was just sort of in awe of this guy. But what was amazing about that experience is I could sort of see what it was like to be on a on a big you know Hollywood film set, and um, mm. so I thought it was amazing. It just I knew that wasn't for me. That wasn't something I'd aspire to try to one day get into because of just how many people were involved and very few people on that set that I, those sets that I was on were actually, um, I guess, making the decisions and, and really, you know, probably the DP, the camera operator, the director, yeah. you know, a couple other, maybe producer, you know, and then everyone else was assisting. And, 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 and as amazing as that apparatus is, I just felt like I want to have my hands on the camera. I want to be, you know, walk, working with small crews and get my hands dirty. And that, that's sort of where yeah. I've, for sure because that was one direction i was going to say like obviously from that encounter you've learned that regardless of of how big the stage can be you still wanted to be one of the guys with the camera in your hands yeah and just and i think just maybe it's my um lack of patience sometimes my interest is to jump in and um you know i i like to i like being dynamic and uh, mm. spontaneous and um just the speed that which you can operate when you're a smaller team 
is um, you can be much more nimble and um, like flexible. Yeah, so that's you know I think that's um, something you know you know what your strengths are and weaknesses and and you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. But um, obviously, you're going going stepping away from that now and and moving on to your next. Uh, um, career path or career arc, you'd say. Like, obviously, you could have then pigeonholed yourself in like commercial video, commercial cinematography, as such, or commercial clients. What kind of pushed you in the direction of then focusing more towards nature and um, landscape and, uh, and 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 animals as well? Yeah, no, it was a, it's a good question. I mean, I, as I said before, had this break early on when I was very nineteen, um, mm. and. Then from there, ended up working with a fellow called David Ireland and doing similar yep. similar work. You know, traveling, got some amazing opportunities with David and traveled and filmed in places like the Solomon Islands, East Timor, mm. or Leste, just after the liberation. We were in there, just probably the first film crew in there in 2002, um, at, and was doing what I what I what I loved. And I wasn't directing yet, but I was. Um, but they were such small teams that you know I mm. could influence the shoot quite a lot. You know, as the camera operator. Yep. You know, it was sort of a co-directing effort in a way. Um, but then, you know, back to Sydney in between trips, you know, things like corporate video and weddings did mm. start to take up a bit of time. And I found I could gain that work quite easily. And from a financial point of view, that was, uh, it was quite good. And mm. uh, it allowed me to to keep buying cameras, keep, you know, I guess growing. But that business um, did end up becoming probably too successful for my first passion and, and suddenly mm. I found myself having no room to do my passion work and that yep. wedding corporate video and the like was um, was just really taking up all my time. And I, I guess I came to a sort of, um, if I'm being honest, you know, there were times that, you know, I was, I was being successful, but I was internally quite saddened that I had sort of given up on my dreams that I really should be, uh -huh. you know, going for my first love. And why, why have I sort of, trapped myself in a way into a business that although I have lots of fond memories of it, I met a lot of amazing people and is, you know, absolutely am proud of the work that I, that I produced in that part of my career, you know, it was not my first love. And um, it was just some big decisions that, that I made that sort of ended up um, enabling me to sort of return to my, my first love. And, and I'm, you know, forever thankful that I, I guess had the, I found a, a way to um, to chase the dreams because they're very hard, and I think people can relate. You know, I think um, um, I mean, there's probably other industries that um, that also have parallels to this. You know, you got to yeah. you got to eat, you got to pay. You know, if if I didn't want to live at home, I wanted to have a wanted yeah. to um, you know break free financially. But where's that balance? And and um, so it's 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 a tricky one to navigate for sure. Absolutely, and I'm sure uh, a lot of people at home listening can identify with what you're saying because especially when you're juggling a creative job uh, with a job that pays the bills um, can be particularly uh, hard and it can be soul crushing as well. Um, I guess when, when was it for you to make the jump? Because you're probably looking at your, your bank account, um, you're, ma you're making good money, um, you, it, the money's coming in, you've obviously got other things to pay for um, and, and the worry of, of, you know, missing out on, on work or, and how you're going to go if you do continue in your passion journey. What was, this, what was the switch? Was there something that internally you felt this is now the time or is, is waiting for a time uh, completely um, fictional? Yeah, I think um, there was, it wasn't probably one singular moment. There was a few opportunities mm. that came the way. I think it's also mindset and how you project yourself. And one thing people do say about, tearing away is that you you almost need to break off and have a clean break in some ways mm. to reset your mind and say i am now doing this yeah rather than having that safety of having a foot in each camp you know i think the the industry that you're trying to break into might not take you fully seriously by mm. continuing that work the previous work didn't seem to affect the fact i was going to africa and going to places and, and doing sort of short films and, and doing wildlife mm. you now trying to get back into wildlife Probably didn't uh, hurt the, my previous work, but um, it was. Um, I think it personally, you know, making that um, that mindset shift is is very important. Um, I mean, look, I think I have um, Canon a huge 
um, I have a huge indebt gratitude to Canon, the breaks that I had at mm-hmm. Canon, and specifically Jason McLean, who was, you know, the director of, of Canon Australia for, for quite a few years and, and you know, had the vision or had the belief that I could um, start producing content for them. And I had some breaks. Uh, I think a big thing with, with my career was certainly Tales by Light and the things that led up to that series. And to tell a very truncated version of it, um, mm. there was an opportunity to shoot some short films for Canon. And yep. uh, Darren Jew, who I'd known, you know, had never been in the field with Darren, but we'd run into each other over the years. And the under- yep. we love Darren here at Camera Pro as well. Great yeah, Camera Pro customer. Yep. Very good. Yeah, Darren's, um, you know, obviously I know of his amazing work for many years and, and, and mm. work in Tonga, photographing the humpback whales. And yep. an opportunity came up at Canon to, pr- to, to present some of their Canon masters, and he was one of their Canon masters. In the, yeah. if, in the, the, the assignment was to just shoot interviews, and one was to shoot me with Darren, and there's a couple of other yeah. at the time. Uh, an interview and then use overlay photographs, quite traditional, yep. quite simple. And, um, yep. you know, it wasn't a particularly huge gig. Um, but as soon as that landed on my lap, you know, I rang up Darren and I said, look, you know, this is this is the opportunity for me to come to Tonga. Mm. Like, why don't, why, don't, why don't I come to Tonga and we film this in the field? He loved the idea. And yep. we'd look, we've been looking for an opportunity to go to Tonga. So what ideas I took, that small budget... And just said to Canon, look, um, we're going to shoot this in um, we're going to shoot this in Tonga in the field. And they were like, well, oh. you know, I wasn't asking for more money. I think we might have they might have paid for a flight, but um, we certainly used all the money that the budget had for the interview. <laughs> Went there, shot him in the field, swimming with whales. I took a drone pilot. This is very early, so 20, 2012, I think. We um, we flew a very early hexcopter over the whales. Probably the first drone. I, I'm, I'm almost certain it was the first drone to be flown with the whales. Uh, probably mm-hmm. pre-regulations, um, and um, we produced this seven-minute film about Darren, and it was him in the field doing what he um, is so good at, and of course, him in his element. He gave an amazing, um, you know, he, he gave he was able to articulate his uh, his passion so well, and we could show him, you know, being surrounded mm-hmm. by these incredible animals. And then that was um, we get we came back we cut this for Canon and they were absolutely over the moon with with the content um, and got a good got a good for a good for good value and then that what it, basically to, to, to try to cut a long story short we we, we oh. I, I was able to use that piece of content and the success of that to say to them look imagine that on on a much bigger platform in a much grander scale taking different photographers into the field and showing them you know how do they capture the images that they do. And yep. it'll be behind the scenes to the to the journey, and um, and to my amazement, and um, that Jason was was all in and had the belief, and we had we we had a green light series, and then of course so much flowed from that, and um, you know I think one of the other things that I was so grateful for is I was able to obviously had to get sign off, but I was able to choose the genres and the photographers that we wanted to to um, feature, and so I could use my own. Um, be guided by my own interests to, to and mm. that's what ended up with people like Art Wolf um, and going and filming tribes and doing underwater, you know, many underwater episodes and wildlife mm-hmm. conservation episodes for that series. So um, I sort of learned very early as well as if you have to, if you have a lot of power in the decision, you know, what a valuable thing that is. You know, we could create the content that we, that I wanted to, to make. Um, and once you have that, um, Freedom, it's very hard to give that up, <laughs> I, I find, and, I, and I, I hope to hang on to it as much as I can. Yeah, great. I guess, obviously, a couple of takeaways there, but um, reading um, a little bit about you um, and seeing a piece of advice you were to give younger filmmakers, uh, which was, life will never be able to stop you from achieving your goal if you want it bad enough. Is that kind of a situation where they gave you a brief, and you look at briefs and then go, how can I make it bigger, bolder? Um, and, and and show my mark on on your particular work. I mean, I think um, it, it has to start with. I think if you're tr- trying to achieve anything, you've got to start. You've got to have a belief that you can achieve it. I think um, yep. you know, without getting too um, you know philosophical philosophical about it. Um, and I think people are drawn to belief and confidence in an idea. Um, yep. So that is very important to have that, um, no matter how lofty or, or, you know, if something hasn't been done, um, obviously with, you, you've still got to then come up with a plan and execute it. Mm. Uh, just having belief in something that will work out is not enough. But um, 
but it needs to start with that. And, you know, I think um, in terms of getting people along or interested in what you're interested in, I've, I think my uncle told me once, you know, he said, if you, if you deeply love something and find it fascinating, mm. interesting, no matter how esoteric, you will find people who also connect with that as well. You know, it doesn't matter how unusual it is. If you try to think about what people might want to see, I don't think that's the right way to go. I think you need to, you know, mm. find it in yourself. And for me, that's that's what's led to all the things that I've done is, is just, you know, I find it fascinating. I know that, okay, not everyone will, but enough mm. people hopefully will that uh, that you have an audience. Um, and uh, I hope yeah. I answered the question. But anyway, that's... No, that's no, it. <laughs> no, no, very good, because I was going to follow that up with another question, but you kind of answered it, I guess, developing that belief in yourself. Uh, obviously... Is that been something that's been instilled from an earlier age with you? Um, because obviously a big part of being a freelance, um, a, a freelance uh, cinematographer or a freelance director or anywhere in as a creative freelance person um, is the ability to be able to sell yourself and, and market yourself. But that comes from a form of belief, right? Yeah, I think people, um, particularly with projects that I'm involved in, they're, they're, they're much backing you as the project. You know, it's mm. intertwined, um, particularly when it's such a hands-on, I guess, um, director's vision type project um, that, yep. that really, they're, they're, you know, you're selling yourself and, and, and the idea as a package um, because we all have different ways of telling stories and, and my way of telling a story will be different to the next person. Um, so I think that's... Um, that's good to know. And, and the other thing I'd say is, you know, surrounding yourself with the best people, like, you know, anyone will tell you that if they're running a big company, then yeah. they'll say the same thing, you know, and I've been really uh, so fortunate to surround myself with amazing, talented, interesting people from the crew at Untitled Filmworks, the guys that I've worked yep. with and girls over the years. Um, and, you know, uh, Dom West, Louis Cooper Robinson and, and, and Lorne and Jean Bradley um, uh, shared um we have all um worked together for many years now so it's been 10 well lj's been with me for um 12 years so i've been very fortunate to build a, a real base of people and of course beyond that the the sound designers and um yeah. composers you know i've been really extraordinary like really extraordinarily lucky to to sort of find and and, and get to work with great people um yeah Oh, yeah, it's, it's a huge part of it. Abraham, obviously talking a bit about um, the longevity of the people you've worked alongside of, um, what tips, I guess, would you have for uh, creatives out there that maybe are trying to do things on their own at the moment and, and how they meet uh, similar sort of uh, people that you've had in your life in terms of um, built working on projects? I think it's... As I said before, just, you know, getting outside your bubble is important. I think that's why travel is so fantastic. You know, if you if you have the ability to travel um, and, and just put yourself in new situations, I think there's nothing um, greater for me. And I, I mean, it's something that n needs more effort these days from it. It needs more um, because of I've got a family, I've got commitments, you know, mm. find time to somehow broaden your horizons uh, takes even more effort than when you're single and younger and maybe have more ability to you know not as many attachments or dependence yep. um so i think it's just and, and if you can't travel then reading outside of your little bubble that's probably one of the downsides mm. of the way we consume media these days is that we are fed whether it's on youtube or social media mm. you just keep getting served up the th same things that you have watched before thinking that so, algorithms work that way so you you create yeah. and, and i'm not talking politically Politically, just in terms of interest, you watch a video about, you know, planting a herb garden, you're just going to keep getting fed the same content, which is probably good in the short term. But in terms of your long term uh, worldview, um, yeah. you know, it's not a good thing. And I think inspiration can come from the unlikeliest of places. In, in, and so I think making a concerted effort, wherever, whatever way it is, to sort of be open to new ideas, if that's of interest to you, but I think it should be. If, if people are creative, I think it's it's good to draw from many sources. So yeah, I, I, it's something that I try to do. Cool, great answer. Um, I guess that my next question as well was touching back on on obviously going through uni and 
and trying to find your place in, in the film industry as such and, and creative industry. Um, how do you go, obviously, on, on, on projects previously where you have might have had a different creative vision to someone else that was on the set? And, that, and how does something, a balance form there? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think I heard, you know, for, for, for theatrical feature films, you know, I, I've heard, I read once, I don't know who said it, but um, uh, one of the big Hollywood directors said, you know, half of their job is casting. You know, mm. <laughs> once they've got the right team, the right people, and you know that they're working with, and that's probably extends to the the crew as well as the on screen cast. Uh, and I think it's true with your creative partners. It's very, very important to align yourself with people. Not necessarily that just believe, think the same way you are, but at least have the, the same personality. If you're going to spend time in a in a small crew situation for weeks or months at a time, you want to make sure that you all get along and that um, you can. Um, achieve a common goal. So I think uh, one thing I had learned, you know, it can be good if you're working with someone new for the first time and you're about to embark on, on something big is to go yeah. and have, maybe go and go away for a couple of days, go and do a little interview, at, uh, go shoot something small, or maybe even just yeah. go and spend some time together rather than it be all, maybe just through a Zoom call. It's not always possible. Um, and sometimes there's a bit of a leap of faith, but it, if they're the right fit for you, then it's only going to strengthen your, the bond that you have, the, the connection. Yep. And if there's something that maybe creatively or, or personality-wise it isn't the best gel, then that will be pretty apparent once you spend some time together. Don't they say, you know, a good test of a friendship is to go travel for a few days? If anyone's ever gone traveling with someone that they don't really know very well, you know, things that things come to light very quickly. So um, this photograph here on the screen at the moment um, is with Dom and Louis, uh, my long-term creative partners um, up in the Arctic. And, yeah, a little rare behind-the-scenes photo together um mm. but yeah i think that's that's a that's a really important lesson that i've that i've learned and and then i find that yeah you you'll you'll be served well by um by investing a bit of that prep prep time yeah cool um a bit of a ju juxtaposition in terms of uh talking about stepping away from creative stuff rather than like obviously your your job can become your life pretty quickly and consume a lot of things around you how do you juggle the balance of, of of saying, all right, I'm just going to take a break for a little while, with with having that fear of of obviously, um, you're not you're not doing anything creative at the moment. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, that's we all struggle with work life balance. Um, mm. The cliche. I mean, one thing that's I, before having children, I I I thought that you know I looked at people that had kids that were you know rushing to get home to families. Thought, mm. gosh, you know, family's going to be there you go home next week or this week but only until I had children I realized okay now now I get what it's all about and you know every day away from my boys I've got three amazing boys one's only six months old one's five and one's three um you know it's it's I don't look at it that way now if I'm not in the field personally shooting and I'm mm. spending time with them then that is that's more valuable you know it's just more valuable and of course I want to be out there I want to keep pursuing my craft. Thankfully, being a producer now, I can be working creatively and not be in the field all the time. So I think that's yeah. a really, um, I'm very thankful that I've sort of ended up doing what I'm doing now. I mean, I still feel like a cinematographer at heart and I still mm. love getting behind the camera, but I don't need to be doing that every day to be creative. Um, yeah. And that's a really great long-term position that I feel like I've sort of worked into. Um, because, yeah, I, I mean, for example, last year, um, I mean, I went, I went away this year for, um, for six weeks into Antarctica, and that was a very unusual mm. um, uh, trip, but it, it had to be done. Um, I have sort of limit, limit myself to three weeks as a sort of max time. There's exceptions to the rule. That was an exception, and I have an incredible wife, Jen, that, that sort of made that possible. Um, but throughout this year, I might have one, one other trip for a few weeks, maybe two or three weeks, once or twice more, and that, and that will be me for the year. So I'd be very, yeah. I feel very blessed that I can have such an amazing family, spend the time with them and get still get to go away occasionally and, and, and uh, when, when it's really important for me to be in the field. Uh, so that's that's sort of the balance that I've struck at the moment. And, you know, who knows, in the future when the boys are, um, are older, maybe leaving school, maybe, you know, I'll be more on the road then. Who knows? But for now, it's a, it's a, it's a good balance I'm trying to strike. Yeah. Beautiful. Now, obviously, talking about 
um, some some of your big projects, obviously Tales by Light. Did at the time, obviously undergoing such a project, did you know how much of a of a of a massive thing that would would indeed become, or was it just kind of developing uh, from episode to episode in the early days? I mean, it was um, yeah. I mean, I threw everything I could creatively into the first series. I think it developed. Yeah. We're proud of the first series. I think the storytelling um, developed further into the second and to the third series. I'd say the third yep. series we were hitting really hitting our stride from a storytelling mm. point of view. Um, but um, I mean, look, we we spent you know we spent the budget you know we and particularly the first series. Well, all of them we we did, but um, you know we 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 spent every last dollar that we had yep. for for it to be on the screen. You know, I knew the opportunity mm. was, and it was like. Mm. I was given this great opportunity. Let's make this, this series as, uh, as the best way we can. And, and obviously, lessons were learned. You know, I think there were yep. we could have stretched our budget further, and we we probably spent money where we didn't need to in the first series. But all good lessons to learn, um, and um, and it all worked out. And, and look, it was a it was a wild success for Canon because re remember, originally it was just an Australian TV exercise. It was to create mm. some content that um, Canon felt confident enough in, in, in me to, to deliver a series that would be airable in Australia. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the Netflix, um, picking, getting picked up by Netflix was never um, never even on the, um, I mean, early, remember too, 20, yeah, Netflix been out for a while, the, the streaming version, but it was still early days for the streaming version as well back in 2013. Um, and by the time the series had had a year and we were sort of looking at the second series, Netflix had obviously grown and grown and, uh, picked it up, and I think what what you know, um, what was amazing. I think the fact that we stretched ourselves to shoot it in four K was also a, a huge tick at the time. They yep. were looking to put a lot more four K content on the platform, and yep. that was a massive, um, um, you know, that was a big help to get it on the platform. And then, of course, you know, little old Canon Australia um, now had a, a, a series that that was for the whole world to see. So I know that, you know, and, and Jason deserves the kudos, um, you know, globally for making that happen. And, and you know, so yeah. I think the investment was, was you know, it, it came back multiple times. Yeah, for sure. And then working with obviously some of the most amazing talent in terms of photography within Australia and, and globally, um, yeah. obviously names like Peter Eastway, um, Darren Jew, Crystal Wright, um, Art Wolf. So, such amazing names. How did that uh, their work inspire you to to push further and 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 seek to to tell their story and give them justice to their work as well? Yeah, I think it was um, I mean, it was pretty easy decisions early on on the first series. You know, just obviously these are all people that I'd had some contact with and knew some of them personally. I actually had spent some time with Art Wolf in Africa, and and Art actually encouraged. He he had made a series called Travels to the Edge which really was a, um, a bit of an inspiration for Tales by Light and, and he'd done multiple seasons and he we did some filming. We were both part of a similar trip um, to East Africa and, you know, he was very kind in his feedback on on the bit of work we'd, that we'd done together. Um, mm. I, yeah, it was an easy... Look, everyone we approached said yes and, and uh, particularly yeah. during the first season, people could see exactly what they're getting themselves into. Um, and then that gave us the confidence to reach out to people like Jonathan and Angela Scott, um, which uh, was an extraordinary um, experience and obviously led to working with them more. And I remember, it's funny, the, the first few days when I was in the truck with Jonathan on that first shoot, I asked him, I said, you know, Big Cat Diary was such a fabulous show and, you know, do you have plans to do more Big Cat Diary? And, um, and Jonathan said, look, no, we're, we're working on other projects. It was fabulous, but, you know, we, we don't have any plans and, you know, we're, yeah. we've got our other endeavours. And, you know, um, and then, of course, um, what happened, we had a fabulous sort of three weeks together in, in Kenya and um, in the Masai Mara. And then on the second last day, we're just driving along. And Jonathan said, we, you know how we said we were sort of that stage was done for us? You know, we'd really like to work with you guys, you know, and, and you know, mm. we did a doing something similar, which was an incredible, um, incredibly flattering. And um, and he just enjoyed the experience and, you know, the way that we worked and, and we loved working with them. So that's um, yep. that's where that came about. And and so we, we you know, jumped into, it was a no-brainer that we'd love to uh, work with them and, and develop a, 
uh, a new series, and uh, and that's what led us to Big Cat Tales, and, uh, and ended up getting it onto Discovery Animal Planet that has two seasons. Um, so yeah, I mean, lots. I always happy to talk about Jonathan and Angela, and um, you know their, their fabulous work, and um, they were an inspiration. It's funny too. I mean, I remember seeing them on sixty Minutes Australia years before with Ray Martin, who who I know as well, and um, just a little bit like my experience with Malcolm Douglas suddenly being in the field, you know, suddenly being with Jonathan and Angela, you know, in the Masai Mara, you know, it's an experience that you can't, you can't buy that experience. And, you know, so I felt extremely lucky and we still feel that way. I know that I could speak for the rest of my team if we ever get time with them. And uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I hope and know that we will do more in the future. Just have to find yeah. the right opportunity. Cool. Um, I guess uh, pretty much covers my next question, but the way, obviously from p pivoting from uh, a creative project to creative project um, and, and being in, in different headspaces with different people, how did you juggle that? Um, and I, and, and what, what tips would you give to other people out there that have, have a mind on one project while they're still developing another one? Yeah, it can, it can be tricky. And I'm sort of going through the process now as we've got a couple of big projects coming towards the end of their run. Um, yep. And how do we, you know, but you need to be looking ahead to the next project. That's a tricky time. It's also an exciting time. Uh, mm. You do need to give yourself time. You do need to carve out time to um, to think and develop new projects. Obviously, always having feelers out there is a good start because you never mm. know when something will strike um, uh, a chord with you. Yeah. But, but finding just headspace and, and whether that's going away, you know, uh, I'd love to and, and hopefully we'll find some time to, to go away as a team in the next few months to just have like a retreat where we go and actually, you know, get away from all the noise and just sit, think about work on the next projects. And, and we have a few ideas that are percolating. I also heard once that, you know, a good idea, something that really needs to be done just won't let go of you. Because sometimes you can get a strike of, in, of inspiration and think yeah. it's the right thing and then it can um, it can sort of soften or it can sort of fade. Um, mm. And other things just don't let, leave you alone. You know, it's like the idea just keeps tapping you on the shoulder or tugging your <laughs> shirt. And they're the ones that, are, that, that need listening to the most. But um, it's not always hugely obvious, too. It's quite subtle. Um, yeah. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I know I'll be working on something next year. And, when, mm. you know, but we haven't made a final decision on, on what that will be yet. So, But it's an exciting time. And, um, yeah, you know, it's... A lot of people don't have that um, luxury of, of excitement. You know, it's maybe it's, you know, next year is very mapped out. So, you know, I, I try to look at it in a positive way rather than a <laughs> scary, what the hell am I going to do next way? <laughs> awesome. Um, I guess uh, my next question leading into that is um, another series that you developed, Ghosts of the Arctic. Um, I did read somewhere in the, um, the bio description um, that, that it felt like a boyhood dream to be able to produce a series like this. What is it about, I guess, um, Arctic conditions and the ice and and animals that live in, in those conditions that appeal so much to you? Yeah, I mean, the I only it's probably well, it was over ten years ago that I had my first trip to the Arctic. Actually, it was with my wife Jen, um, and we were on a ship with a lot of other um, passengers up to Svalbard. Um, mm -hmm. In Greenland, the first one, but it was up in the north in the Arctic. Um, yep. And we we're on a ship, and you know, gosh, we were in our late 20s, and um, uh, it was maybe early 30s. Um, but I remember looking around, and the fortunate people who were there on the trip as photographers and you know, living their lifelong ambition to get to the Arctic, most of the people were in their 60s and 70s, and you know, a lot of people were gingerly climbing down a ladder to get into a Zodiac. And, you know, we both looked at each other and thought, gosh, how lucky are we to be having this experience <laughs> now? Yeah. No, when, yeah. uh, you know, how many people are our age of getting the opportunity. So that was, you know, it's never lost mm. to me. But more to your question, I mean, just, it's just so um, different to our everyday life. I mean, you know, parts of Svalbard, particularly going up in winter and up to the Canadian Arctic uh, or, you know, I've spent time in Antarctica, South Georgia. Some of these places feel like you're on another mm. planet. Um, it, it, Greenland, you know, it really is so extraordinary. The landscape, the wildlife. Um, obviously, the Arctic has more of the human history too, which is, you know, I find very 
fascinating. Always drawn to to that as well. Um, yeah. What's not like? What's not to like about these parts of the world if you're lucky enough to get there? And to go there with purpose is just so special. You know, to go not just as a, a tourist, but actually to go and capture it, tell a story about either the person you're with, but hopefully more about the place and what is there already. Um, and these are such rapidly changing parts of our world that um, you know you feel like, gosh, is this this needs to be documented, needs to be shared, mm. these, these stories need to be told because it is so uh, hard to relate. Uh, one of the one this sort of interest or this this mindset led to a passion project, which is a, isn't actually currently um, public, but it will be soon. And gosh, mm. we started quite a few years ago now, but this is uh, back in 2017. Um, I'd always been fascinated by glaciers and carving glaciers and just the, the raw power of of falling ice and seeing some YouTube videos. And I thought, gosh, you know, the drone tech that I've that we've been using for the last few years would be an, an extraordinary way to capture um, the melt. You know, we all hear about in the news just the the speed, the, the rapid disintegration of uh, the Greenland's ice sheets and, and the, the ice shelves in Antarctica, but Yep. Where are the visuals, you know, and we know as photographers, filmmakers, how, how the power of the, of the still image and the moving image to communicate. Um, so we went up uh, on our own dime and um, spent a week filming this glacier, um, trekking up. We weren't living in that tent, but we were trekking up from um, from, a, from a camp about, it was about a 12-kilometre round trip, and we spent a week flying the drones as the ice was uh, disintegrating and that particular glacier was there was a lodge built called glacial i think it was called glacier lodge mm-hmm. uh, right at the face of the glacier and then you know it was built five years ago and now it's a six kilometer walk to the glacier uh terminal face so you know mm. how crazy is that you know something glacial speed used to mean something you know it used to mean something mm-hmm. very different. You're moving at glacial speed if you say you're moving at glacial speed well you're moving pretty quick i think now um so, and that was a passion project. And I, I've spoken about this before, but I think it's so important to um, find room to do things that don't have a monetary incentive necessarily, or a, you know, a, a, a commissioned incentive to yep. go. Because sometimes these these ideas need to go and be they need to be explored, and mm. the way to do it is to just go and do it. And so, yes, I understand that you know, to do something like this, you know, took some means to, to get up there, even if we're not paying us our, paying ourselves, we've still got flights, accommodation, you know, to get and to spend a week. Um, yep. But I used the in, I used some some capital between projects and thought, I'm going to invest this into ourselves and into an idea. Um, and every time we've done that, and there's been a, a handful um, over the years, they've always led to something amazing, something much better than we, you know, far far more than the investment of time and money into the project. So yep. my only regret is that we don't, I haven't done more of these, um, more of these trips, these passion projects. Um, and, I, you know, my advice to people is it doesn't have to be as grand as going up and filming the glaciers with drones. It can be much more uh, a humble ambition. But, you know, there's wherever you live, there's usually most people live within a distance of something, a person, whether it's an amazing person to go and meet, maybe, maybe shoot mm. a short film on or some natural story in nature i mean they're you know they're obviously speaking to my strengths and interests here um mm. but it could be something else could be could be motocross could be you know sport or you know anything else fashion but um and i think also you know people we talked your earlier question about you know how do you get the breaks how do you how do you get into an industry i think some of my biggest breaks with canon was i was doing passion projects about kit you know a new camera came out one of the first things that put me on the radar for canon that led to tales by light and everything else darren jew and the rest is that there was a camera that came out, the 1DC. It was the first 4K DSLR very yep. early. I think it might have been 2011 or 10, maybe. Um, possibly 12. can't remember. Someone will fact check that. But um, the camera came out. We were, we were able to get a hands-on one. I convinced Canada Lend. I had a little bit of a relationship there and said, look, they had one of the first ones in the, in the world. Mm. And you could do 4K video. So we went and shot this little short about, you know, could you pull stills from this 4K footage? You know, what would that look like? And we shot this. We overproduced this bit of content just for fun because I thought it would be great. And, you know, it's funny enough, Philip Bloom, who a lot of people will know, just happened to walk into the studio in Sun Studios where we were shooting some interviews one day. He'd never been to Sydney, I don't think. And this is a guy who was very prominent in that world and was a big voice mm. in, 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 you know, filmmaking, particularly DSLR filmmaking. 
I mean, serendipity strikes, you know, when you put yourself out there. And anyway, that bit of content led to so much because um, no one asked us to do that. No one would have asked us to make that bit of content, but it gave a huge amount of, it gave me a huge break at Canon. So, and and all of these projects, all of these passion projects have led to something. Um, And so, you know, that's my advice is don't wait for the opportunities. You've got to make your own opportunities sometimes, even if you are happen to be on your path. Well, then why not keep making breaks and opportunities for yourself? Um, And so I, you know, I plan to keep doing passion projects in between, you know, the bigger commissioned projects uh, as long as I can. Yeah, that's great. And obviously in 2017, being recognised by your peers as well, uh, winning a cinematography award um, within Australia. Um, Do do you take moments to reflect um, on your achievements? Is that something that, that, that really felt special to you or is it just more of, you know, the job's not done yet, um, we, we've got to share some more stories? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, that was an incredible um, honour to receive the, it was an Australian Cinematography of the Year award. Um, mm. I had never even aspired to that uh, award. It was, it was so ridiculous. It was, you, you know, a lot of um, uh, Oscar winners, DPs um, had won that over the years, mostly feature films. It's usually won by feature film categories. And, um, you know, in, in that year, uh, Tales by Light was was enough to, to 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 grant me that award. That was that was really mm. special. It's funny though the but the my accreditation as as an amazing as that was the accreditation to get the letters the um, ACS letters uh, from Australian Cinematography Society was um, yep. funny enough meant even more maybe because it was just it, it's a recognition from your peers and it, it, mm. it made a very small set of people in Australia who were professional cinematographers but that meant you know a hell of a lot and. I think I said when I received it, you know, I've only sort of probably shed a tear a couple of times. You know, one was sort of <laughs> getting the phone call from the president on that one. And then, you know, obviously the birth of my son also was, you know, in that bucket. But, um, you know, it just meant a hell of a lot. And, um, yeah, you know, I think, but that's all we, you know, it means so much, doesn't it, to, to, to be any recognition from people who you respect means the world. You know, it means more yeah. than than anyone. Um, and um, And, of course, you know, my biggest... Critic, but the person I do like to please, the great bellwether, is is my wife, my lovely, beautiful wife, Jen. And I do, you know, she's got a very good, keen sensibility about her, and you know, she doesn't blow smoke at all. So I love showing Jen projects that I'm working on, and I get a very honest opinion. Um, you know, they, they do say don't ask friends and family opinion, for their opinions because they'll often lavish you with what you want to hear. But she is quite the opposite, and and, and because she's so harsh. But fair in her feedback, you know, when she does like something, I know that you know I'm probably onto something here. If if, if Jen does, if it passes the Jen approval, so I'm very lucky to have that. That's um, some brutal honesty. I yeah. like it. So <laughs> it's good, but um, yeah, I mean, look, the the awards are, are, are a great thing, but you know, I think um, I'm my own harshest critic, and and I think mm. probably if everyone's honest with themselves, if you believe, and 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 really. We're not, uh, we're not doctors, we're not, you know, fighting cancer, we're not doing the really important stuff. It, you know, these things are important and I don't want to dismiss the arts, but I do like yeah. the perspective, you know, without getting a huge head about what we do. Um, I think it's good to to stay humble and, and to know that, yeah, you know, the, the world will keep spinning if we're not doing what we do and, and we're very fortunate uh, to do it. So it's good to have a healthy, healthy reminder of that, um, you know, regularly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, probably my final question, um, Abraham, because I know we're a bit short on time at the moment, unfortunately, but we could we could ask these questions for forever. But um, knowing how passionate and um, with cons- the environment um, and, and, and how that feels for you and you're seeing some beautiful locations and, um, and, and wildlife that may never see- be seen again, um, mm-hmm. And, and how does that sit with you in telling the story and doing the stories justice? And, and, and how, how can we do better, I guess, in some ways? Such a broad question, I know. Yeah, no, I think the, uh, I, I mean, you're right. I, I've always been, I have been drawn to nature, whether it be underwater mm. or topside, um, but the natural world and, you know, what's happening to the, to the natural world and to species loss and, um, you know, but I know the power of filmmaking. Um, 
photography too, of course, but you know, filmmaking has a as a unique um, uh, ability to, you know, influence and strike um, an emotional connection with people, and you know, it's a powerful tool to to um, spread the word and. The age, the cliche is true that people can only lo love and care about things they know about. They can't do that if they don't know. So the first step is to actually bring awareness to, to issues, yeah. and and you know it needs to be, for want of a better word, entertaining. You need to draw people mm. in. You know, it can't just be a um, too too sciencey or too uh, too preachy. It has to be some yeah. sort of. It has to be a, you know, because really at the end of the day, you know, when we all live busy lives, it, leave lead busy lives even myself i come home i you want to relax um often we turn to escapism um and if something's too heavy people won't engage so there is a balance mm. that that i've learned that you need to find that that balance but but if you find that balance and you can you can reach a big audience you know film has an incredibly powerful way to to um to motivate and change behavior in people by building yeah. that that connection um and so i I can plan to keep, you know, swimming in that in that pool. Um, and yeah. there's sadly ne a, ne a never-ending, um, you know, list of, of of subjects that could be covered. I also think it's very important to highlight real and champion real success stories because people can yeah. get disconnected and think, "Gosh, you know," particularly the younger generation. I mean, it is terrifying just to see the onslaught of news stories about doom and gloom and, and the world and the climate crisis and lack of you know, the collapse of biodiversity uh, really important just to, to highlight wins and successes and uh, you know Raja Ampat was a great example in the second series of Tales by Light looking at what can happen if you give nature a chance to bounce back the reefs uh, there they've, they've, they've gotten out of the illegal fishing and, and the, the sharks are slowly starting to return the biodiversity or the, the, the abundance is bouncing back in, in these areas that have been uh, deemed uh, marine reserves um, mm. and that is really important and I know a lot of people in this space also share that belief that you do need to uh, champion things then people think we can make a difference we you know nature can yeah. bounce back there can be resilience um, yeah. things like you know we, we've also got another project we're working on in uh, Sumatra with you know um, regenerative forests and replanting of forests and things that didn't seem possible that are being done um, those stories need to be given a voice to because that can build you know, give people the the inspiration to to not just give up, um, which I think too much doom and gloom can do. So there's a, there's definitely a a balance there. Yeah, and and I think sometimes the emphasis on mainstream media as well as obviously the, it's going to be the doomsday sort of cycle news, and that's what people pay attention to. But I think there are important stories out there, and there there are people doing some really good stuff. So that's really important to share. Yeah, def definitely. I feel strongly about that. Yeah. Awesome, Abraham. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on tonight. Um, and it's Thank been you. amazing to hear all the advice you've given. Um, and obviously, you haven't gatekeeped any of the advice you, you've, you've said tonight. And I think it's such an inspirational thing for someone uh, so high up in, in the, the community, uh, cinematography and otherwise. So we really appreciate everything you've, you've been able to give us tonight. Oh, thanks, Jackson. Yeah, absolute pleasure. And hopefully, there's been some little nugget that someone's been able to take away from, from my experiences. And, um, yeah, we'll do it again Absolutely. sometime. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, Abraham, where do people find you just just um, quietly at the end there? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've got my Untitled Filmworks website is where a lot of our work is. And then um, yep. I've got a personal, we've got a, of course, we've got a social media for Untitled and, and I've got a um, Instagram as well. Not as updated as I would like it to be. I do mm -hmm. tend to like to post regular things and 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 but soon very soon there'll be two big big projects that we can talk about and shout about um that will be coming out in the within the next several months so um Perfect. for people looking for i guess more more current projects it has been a little quiet for a while but we've got some um, some big stuff on the way so um yeah happy to can't wait to share brilliant thank you so much abraham we'll keep a keen eye on on everything that 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 comes up from you very appreciative again of your time. Thanks, Jackson. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Legend. So that was uh, Abraham Joff, and obviously such an inspirational character as well. Uh, very passionate about the environment. Um, and if, if you get the chance on Netflix, um, if you're going to watch one piece of um, 
great TV on Netflix. I would really highly recommend the Tales by Light series. Um, every episode is absolutely spot on and informative and brilliant. So thank you, Abraham. It was absolute pleasure. Um, and obviously, thanks for joining us tonight um, for another On the Couch with Canon. Um, and we'll just quickly highlight some events that we've got coming up on Saturday. We've got uh, the event with Dale Travers um, and Pro Photo, uh, which will be brilliant, um, which we'll be hosting here in Brisbane. Um, and then we've also got the Brisbane Photography Festival uh, coming up. Uh, tickets will be released soon, so stay tuned to our socials, Camera Pro AU. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We hope you had fun and hope there was a lot of information uh, and inspiration coming from Abraham, which I thought was truly special. Thank you, Tim. <laughs>